Lifeline, two medical breakthroughs, new techniques that could revolutionize organ transplants and cure diabetes. Plus surviving a heart attack when every second counts, a new way to save more lives. The war in Kosovo, will it ever end? Are these new signs of peace the most promising yet? In depth, summer airfares heating up, major airlines raise ticket prices, how high can they go? The truth about bargain fares on the internet. And the lying game. Do you know who's telling the truth and who's lying? There are ways to tell. From NBC News World Headquarters in New York, this is NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Good evening. We begin tonight with two major breakthroughs in medicine that should extend the lives of millions of people. First, a critical development in dealing with organ transplants and even curing diabetes. The immune system is the key here. After all, the body doesn't take to foreign organs, so powerful drugs have been required to make transplants work. Now, genetic engineering, altering the immune system, could mean dramatic gains. NBC's chief medical correspondent is Robert Bazell. It is a breakthrough in organ transplantation that could have astounding implications for all sorts of diseases, even a potential cure for diabetes. This type of approach could revolutionize transplant medicine. So far, research in monkeys only, but so promising that human trials start within months. Until now, the problem with transplantation has been that the body's immune system rejects transplanted tissue so vigorously that some transplants are not possible and others require harsh anti-rejection drugs. In the new research, scientists were able to use a genetically engineered drug to retrain the immune system, altering white blood cells so that the body accepts the transplanted tissue without anti-rejection drugs. At the University of Miami, Dr. Norma Kenyon and Dr. Camilio Ricordi for the first time successfully transplanted the cells called islets that manufacture insulin. Monkeys with a condition like diabetes now can survive and stay healthy without insulin shots. This appears to be a significant advance and one step closer into what may eventually lead to a cure for type 1 diabetes. Amazing news for the almost one million Americans like Jane Addams who suffer from the most serious form of diabetes, type 1. To keep their blood sugar at normal levels, most diabetics must constantly monitor their blood and inject insulin several times a day. But even with insulin, diabetes can get out of control, bringing loss of eyesight and limbs, heart attacks and death. There's an everyday um, burden of, of dealing with your diabetes, but there's also an emotional and kind of frightening burden about what lies ahead in your future. Using the new transplantation technology, other scientists managed to transplant kidneys in monkeys without using anti-rejection drugs. If it works in humans, transplants will become much simpler. People could have their organ failure cured and then go about their normal daily lives without being uh, tethered by the side effects of immunosuppressive medication. That dream could become a reality as early as this summer when human trials begin of the new kidney transplant technique and the new attempt at curing diabetes. Robert Bazell, NBC News, New York. Another medical breakthrough tonight that offers significant new hope for heart attack victims. A combination of drugs, a one-two punch that has the potential for saving thousands of lives. Details now from NBC's Robert Hager. When a severe heart attack first strikes, when every second counts, the new study tonight says a new treatment, injections of two clot-busting drugs instead of one, can dramatically improve your chances of survival. Until now, doctors relied only on a drug called TPA to try to stop heart attacks in progress. The new treatment adds a drug called RioPro. Some call it super aspirin. The old one-drug treatment with TPA alone works about half the time. The study says in combination with RioPro, it works in 77% of cases. A 17% better chance of breaking up a clot like this one, the dark spot on this beating heart, and starting blood flowing normally to the heart again. At Mount Sinai Medical School in New York, Dr. David Forsheimer. This is a very important study with very important findings, which will likely change the way we practice cardiac medicine, not now, but in the immediate future. Charles McAllister knows firsthand. He suffered a massive heart attack, says the new drug combination saved his life. They told me that uh, I'd come in and I was uh, ashen gray in color and that they thought that they, would, they were going to lose me. 
So I really credit this this drug with uh, opening my uh, my vessels and uh, doing just exactly as it was designed to. Here again, the dark spot is a clot. The whole artery up here is filled with this big, enormous blood clot. But after treatment with TPA alone, it's only partially dissolved. You can still see how the artery is still incompletely open. The blood clot is still partially there. Adding RealPro improves treatment by punching holes in the outer surface of the clot, makes it easier for the other drug, TPA, to penetrate and dissolve it completely. But to be sure there are no unexpected side effects, many doctors may hold up on large-scale use of the new two-drug combination until completion of another larger study just now getting underway. But for now, it looks like the two drugs may work just as well as much more complex heart surgery. Why some tonight say it has the potential to revolutionize treatment and save lives. Robert Hager, NBC News, Washington. More health news tonight. Good news for women on estrogen replacement therapy. A new study out shows women can take lower doses of estrogen and get the same benefits with fewer side effects if they also take extra calcium and vitamin D. This discovery could help millions of women avoid bone loss from osteoporosis because they're better able to tolerate estrogen at a lower dosage. There's some bad news tonight about the food supplement that is known as Andro. It was in the news last year because the home run champion, Mark McGuire, acknowledged that he was using Andro. It's supposed to work like steroids to build muscle, but a study out tonight shows it is not a muscle builder. In fact, it could lead to serious side effects from enlarged breast tissue to cholesterol and cancer risk. Just ahead here, the students of Columbine High in Littleton returning for the first time to the scene of the tragedy that changed their lives. What was it like? Help. That's the best, the best I can describe it. I never wish this on my worst enemy. What it was like to go back inside Columbine High after the massacre. Yeah. NBC News in depth tonight, airfare soaring again. What's going on? And the plain truth about those internet so-called bargain airfares. In Littleton, Colorado, six weeks to the day after the massacre at Columbine High, students were allowed back into their school building for the first time. It had been sealed off as a crime scene. It was, by all accounts, a strange, unsettling experience. Going back to find book bags, homework, glasses, even half-eaten lunches, exactly where they'd been left when the gunfire started. Here's how some of those students felt today as they expressed it in their own words. I ran out those doors that I just walked out of. Those were the doors that I ran out of. That's where my friends were hiding. It's hard to go back in and know that two of your classmates wanted to ruin you and your school. It was scary, but, you know, something that everybody's got to do. Because it's our school and we can't let them take it away from us. And that's what they were trying to do. I don't think that that's right. It gives me a little bit of peace of mind that to see everybody one more time, make sure they're all right. I just miss it a lot. And it'll just kind of be like closure. Because when we go back next fall, it's not going to be the same. Help? That's the best, the best I can describe it. I never wish this on my worst enemy. Hope it never, ever happens again. Really wish these copycat acts would stop. Columbine High School students tonight in their own words after returning to their building for the first time. And while that was going on in Littleton, President Clinton was in Washington with a fresh attack on violent videos, video games, and movies. He ordered the Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission to investigate how the entertainment industry markets violent products and whether in fact they deliberately target children. Another big wildfire has nearly 500 firefighters from 30 states converging on the Florida-Georgia border tonight. Wind-driven flames have burned 53,000 acres of the famous Okefenokee Swamp. So far, experts said, unless it rains hard soon, it could take two more weeks to put this fire out. And the video camera was rolling near Dodd City, Kansas last night when a big, extremely mean-looking tornado dropped down. Luckily, it was in an open field, so... There was no damage, no injuries here. Now to the crisis in Kosovo and the battles being fought on two fronts tonight. There is no let-up in the bombardments from the warplanes of Operation Allied Force 
And at the negotiating table, there is some cause for optimism. We get the latest now from NBC's Andrea Mitchell. It is a day of more accidental bombs and what some are calling promising diplomacy. Outside the war zone in neighboring Albania, American A-10 warthogs strike Albanian bunkers. Another mistake. So how close is peace? One positive sign, America's best hope for brokering a deal. Finland's President Atasari, in Germany today, says he'll make his first trip to Belgrade tomorrow. A trip he would not take unless he thought there was at least a chance for progress. We have come now to the point when the clarity has to be sought from the Yugoslav end. As of today, day 70, what has the war cost the U.S.? Officials say as much as $2.2 billion, $60 million a day. What are the human costs? NATO says 225,000 men missing in Kosovo, at least 6,000 executed, 10 mass graves, 1.5 million displaced persons and refugees inside and outside Kosovo. NATO acknowledges 460 civilian deaths from its bombs. The Serbs say the number is 2,000. So what is still unresolved in order to make peace? The size of a future Serb force in Kosovo. Milosevic wants 20,000 men. The U.S. says no more than 1,000. Also, who controls a peacekeeping force? Milosevic says it must be U.N., not NATO. NATO says it must be in charge. But is Milosevic finally showing signs of compromise? The Allies are skeptical. I think Milosevic has shown time and again of wanting to give an opening, a step forward, and then to step backward. Still, for the first time, the negotiations seem real. I think peace is in the air in the sense that all sides now are clearly anxious for a deal. But that does not mean that it will come quickly. U.S. officials think Milosevic may be softening, but that does not mean that he is ready to accept NATO's terms. Tom? NBC's Henry Mitchell at the State Department tonight. Thanks very much. On Wall Street today, the blue chips managed to recover from a big drop early in the day, at one point falling 150 points. The Dow Jones Industrial Average ended up 36 and a half points a day. NASDAQ lost 58 and a half, and all the top five technology stocks today, they all closed down, as you can see. When we come back, the high cost of flying, going online to buy airline tickets, but are you really getting the best deal? And later, to tell the truth, just who are the liars? You'll be surprised how hard it is to tell the science of spotting the telltale clues of lying. NBC News in depth tonight, flying high. Just in time for the busy summer travel season, airfares are taking off once again. The summer passengers will take nearly 34 million plane trips. That's an increase of 3% over last summer. And as more people head for the airport, more airlines are raising their prices. What's going on? We begin tonight's in-depth reporting with NBC's Ann Thompson. Just in time for summer vacations, the cost of flying is taking off. The cheaper fares are gone. Today, five more major carriers raised their leisure fares 4%. At Crossroads Travel Agency outside Chicago and throughout the country, agents giving travelers bad news. If you don't issue the ticket immediately, the fare can go up tomorrow. It can go up in an hour. This is the third price hike this year, an overall increase of 11% on leisure travel. In a really competitive marketplace, consumers could always talk with their feet. But in this marketplace, where do you go? Leading the charge this time, Continental, with seven other major carriers joining over the holiday weekend. The airlines say it's a matter of supply and demand. Planes are packed, carrying a record number of passengers this summer. The reality is that major carriers raise fares when they can, and they perceive they have that opportunity today. The price hike in dollars and cents means Chicago to Honolulu round trip purchased three weeks in advance was $833. Today, $868. From New York to Orlando, last week $348, now $362. Los Angeles to Washington, D.C., $24 more. Rich Turner, husband and father of three, will now have to adjust his vacation budget. With the third airfare increase so far, there may be more this summer. Uh, it kind of leaves me uh, kind of in a lurch. While the fare hikes may hurt the traveler's checkbook, analysts say the airlines will see just a small increase in their bottom line, only one to two tenths of a percent during this peak flying season. But a different story for consumers. 
message is get out your wallet if you want to travel. As long as demand stays high, analysts say there won't be many price cuts on the horizon. Ann Thompson, NBC News, Chicago. More and more people are going to the internet to buy their airline tickets, but is that the best way to get a good deal? Continuing tonight in depth, here's NBC's Kelly O'Donnell. No travel agency, no endless wait in line. Instead, venturing online to bargain hunt for cheap airfares on the internet. Experts say you can find deals that save you 30%, 50% or more. But buyer beware. It's a fallacy to think that you always get a cheaper price if you go online as opposed to calling a, a, your, your travel agent. To save online, you must track prices in a maze of websites, a virtual flea market of sellers touting low, low fares. Tom Parsons of bestfares.com says buyers must spend hours to do their homework. The trick is you find all the stuff on the internet, and then you get your little calculator and find out this deal's really better than the other. Why the big savings? Many internet ticket brokers sell at little or no profit to attract new customers. Airlines also operate websites. They often cut price to sell empty seats. Online discounting lets them offer lower fares discreetly without triggering competitive price wars. Getting a deal usually means being flexible about the day and time you fly, how many stops you make, and often giving up frequent flyer miles. Melinda Edwards has been on the hunt for the past year and still hasn't booked a seat. The quotes that I have gotten have always been much higher than the ones that I've been able to get directly from the airlines. WSB. Every day on Atlanta's airwaves, Clark Howard talks bargain travel. Welcome to the Clark Howard Show. You're he hears raves about the savings and a steady stream of complaints. They didn't get what they booked or they were charged something different than what they thought they should be. And then there's nobody to talk to. They're just stuck. Americans will spend more than $3 billion this year buying airline tickets online. Willing to put up with the hassles, hopeful about saving big. Kelly O'Donnell, NBC News, Los Angeles. I'll be right back. Last year, this country went through a forced national seminar on the many ways of lying in the Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky scandal. But what did we learn about lying? Well, it turns out there are serious scientific ways to spot a lie. But they might not be what you think. Here's NBC's Jim Ottawa. You had the opportunity to go to drug... District Court 228, Houston, Texas. Like Judge Ted else. Poe on the bench in what he calls the Palace like of Perjury. The first casualty in a courtroom is the truth. On this day, a parade of the accused. No one ready to admit anything. You use cocaine? No, Your Honor. Eventually, Ann McKinney will plead guilty to violating probation, but not before a string of denial. Now, is that true or not true? Not true. So they're, they're wrong about that, too? Yes, Your Honor. After 18 years pounding a gavel, Judge Poe thinks he can read the face of a liar. Rolling their eyes, throwing their hands, being too forceful is another example of lying. But can anyone really judge who's lying? Recently published studies say, until now, no. Judges, police, psychiatrists, they all believe they can spot a liar, but score no better than anyone else. Wrong half the time. But now there may be a way to spot a liar with near certainty. Dr. Paul Ekman, the nation's leading authority on lying, studies miles of videotape documenting a pattern of 30 to 40 facial tics and body movements that reveal the lie 95 percent of the time some of it's in the voice some of it's in the body some of it's in the face some of it's in the eyes watch this face a man struggling to hide his real opinion of smoking in public places at the same time he says his opinion strongly he's going to shrug his shoulders which completely contradicts it now look for what Dr. Ekman calls micro-expressions, small facial movements, truth leaking into the face of a liar. First he'll show a little perplexity in the eyebrows, and then he'll show us a little sign of fear. And finally, an unnatural blink. He'll hold the eyes closed longer than usual. And what does that tell you? He's needing extra time to think about what to say. Research shows that 5% of the American public are born liars, really successful, with falsehoods impossible to detect. But the rest cannot thoroughly hide what they're thinking because emotions betray them, showing up in the face. With real sadness, the, there's a muscle right here in the forehead that contracts. Example, Susan Smith, South Carolina mother who drowned her children and lied about it. 
She's pulling her brows together and lowering them, whereas in sadness, you would expect to see those inner brows coming up. California's Salk Institute is going one step further, developing a computer that can detect a genuine smile from a fake used as a cover-up by tracking individual face muscles. Is this a smile or deception? His forehead muscles are not in happiness mode. Uh, Data that could one day help Judge Poe turn the palace of perjury into the house of truth. Jim Avila, NBC News, Chicago. That's not news for this Tuesday, and that's the truth. Don't forget Dateline tonight at 10. I'm Tom Brokaw, and I'll see you back here tomorrow night.